Hello, everyone, and welcome to this talk. <laughs> um, I am Sebastiano. I work at Novoda in London. I'm an Android Google, Google developer expert. Um, you, if you have any questions about what I'm going to say, you can just catch up with me later. Uh, I'm going to be around, probably. Uh, or you can find me on social networks, uh, Google Plus and Twitter, mostly. Uh, there's a weird hashtag if you want to tweet random stuff to me. Uh, not talk related. Okay. Uh, one sec. Uh, okay. Good. So, I don't know if you've ever dealt with um, native uh, calls to the Canvas API. Uh, so if you have done any custom drawing on Android, uh, what I found myself uh, over the years is that most of the time, that is my face when I'm doing it. I'm really confused most of the time because there's a lot of things that are not uh, clear enough, that are not explained, uh, some dark tricks and secrets and black magic that you need to do to have things working appropriately. Also, there's usually someone else that is trying to help me, which is just as confused. Um, so what you can do is, of course, you can go and look at the documentation. Um, or when that doesn't help, which is most of the time, you can go and look at the Java code, which most likely will, likely will just call uh, native code. So you can have a lot of fun uh, going uh, down to C++ and trying to understand what's going on. Um, but that will just give you a narrow view of what you're doing. What I want to do with this talk is put together all the, the information that is scattered uh, throughout the code and the documentation and possibly something more and just give you a big picture. So let's get started. Uh, is there quick show of hands. Is there anyone here that has used the Canvas API so far? A uh, couple of people. Huh? Yes or no. Has. Okay. I would say a third to a half of the people. Okay. Um, the rest of you, well, you've actually used it. You didn't know, but the Canvas API is what every single thing that shows on the screen on Android uses in the end. So even if you just put a hello world with a simple uh, text view there, well, that's Canvas API at work for you. So what is this Canvas anyway? Uh, the Canvas uh, is actually a fitting name because it's basically, as in real life, uh, the Canvas uh, is basically a canvas where you can just paint stuff on. Um, it is basically uh, acting like a buffer, um, a graphic buffer that you can um, update using the calls of the, of the API. Um, and as in real life, there's a few things you need to, to have besides the canvas itself. Um, most importantly, some paint, because if you have a canvas and you don't have anything to paint it with, well, it's not going to work. Uh, and there's also... Um, other stuff that we're going to see, not all of it, because there's really a lot of them. Um, again, there is really not that much documentation uh, about how things work. So it's actually improving now. It's getting a bit better. I will show you uh, some things that are actually uh, explained in the, the, in the documentation and most things that are not. Um, but I think recently uh, some stuff has been added on the Android open source website, so not developer.android.com, but source.android.com regarding the graphic subset of the system. So if you're dealing with Canvas, that's a good place to look at. Now, Canvas is what you see uh, from Java, from uh, the Android framework, but what actually powers the whole thing is Skia. Skia is a, a 2D uh, rendering engine. 
uh, that is also used in Chrome and Chrome OS. Uh, so basically, Android and Chrome share a lot of native code that to, to do UI and, and whatever. Um, it's capable of doing some, well, normal stuff you would expect from a graphics framework like coloring pixels, drawing shapes, and things like that. But it's also, it also has some advanced and peculiar things that you can do with it. Uh, we're going to see some of them later. But just to name a few, you have transfer modes, you have shaders. Uh, yeah, there's really a bunch of things that you can do. But at the same time, as with basically everything Android, it kind of sucks. So I don't think you can really see it there. But that image is actually from uh, an application <laughs> that Eugenio <laughs> was <laughs> working on. And he was trying to draw a circle and, and then draw arcs on, on sectors of the, of the circle. And it turns out that he is not able to do that. So if you try to, to draw arcs on top of, of uh, well, actually one on top of the other, the approximation that Skia does to do it is wrong. And uh, you get misaligned stuff. So you can see there's a, like some stuff coming out on the sides. It's not really visible on this. I'm sorry. But good news is they have allegedly fixed it in Chrome recently, uh, a few weeks ago. So maybe in Android 11, that will be on devices as well. Um, also, text is a pain to deal with, but that's a general thing. It's not just Android. It's just harder because we like pain. Um, and there is no documentation, of course, because literally the only documentation about Skia is three wiki pages on the Skia website that are actually uh, an average of 10 lines long. So yeah. And it's also quite old, probably not maintained or anything. Um, that said, we have to be fair. The Canvas API is still OK. It's still cool. Um, you can actually use the Canvas API and leverage hardware acceleration on a device without even knowing it. It's completely transparent to you. There's a subset of, um, of Skia that is called Hardware UI, which is um, a project that started, it's not actually developed by the Skia team, but it has been developed by a separate part of the team um, and was done especially for Android. And it allows uh, Skia and all the UI on Android to be drawn using OpenGL ES on the GPU. Um, for our purposes, even though you're basically using hardware UI all the time unless you disable it manually, uh, we're just going to talk about Skia because from an API standpoint, they're exactly the same thing. There are a few differences, though, um, and some limitations between hardware and software um, rendering. Just quickly, this comes from, um, from the developer.android.com website. Uh, and then you can see this is a table. It's actually fairly old. They haven't updated it, or they hadn't last time I checked, uh, which was quite some time ago. Um, but you can see that it's improving. So over the API levels, some of the things that, are, that weren't supported now are kind of supported, not all of them. Um, I strongly recommend you to go and take a look at it. Um, you don't need to just take it now if you want. I'm going to publish the slides anyway. Uh, but yeah, just in case. Uh, OK, so how do you use a canvas? Well, everything on a canvas is done um, using matricial transformations. So I hope you like linear algebra, or you like trying and trying and trying until it works, which is my approach. Um, there is um, something that must be said about Canvas is that all the Canvas APIs must be used on the main thread. So you cannot do drawing in the background thread. This is enforced uh, in the framework is some of the things actually have a really good reason for it. Uh, mostly uh, providing um, vertical sync. So when the display is refreshed, uh, and 
making sure that everything is drawn on the screen at the right time because otherwise you will get, you could have half of the previous frame and half of the next frame on screen at the same time, which would not look good. Um, you can, out of, anyway, do some drawing and some crazy stuff on a background thread. You can use something like a surface view, but that's basically painful and difficult, and there's so many things that, that can go wrong that I would strongly recommend you to try and do things on the main thread unless you really, 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 really have to move outside of the main thread. One last thing about the canvas that has to be said is the canvas is stateful, which means that a canvas has a state. Um, it's kind of like a video game where you can save the state of the things and then go back to it. It's pretty much the same. So how does it work? Well, you basically do um, a call to canvas.save or canvas.save to count uh, that freezes or saves uh, the state, the current state of the canvas. So it, that means transformations, um, camera position, rotation, whatever. Then you do whatever you need. So you can, for example, move the canvas again, uh, translate and scale it to draw things in a different way. And what you do at the end when you're done and you have to remember doing it because otherwise uh, just uh, you don't want to do that. Um, you have to re restore the original state of the canvas, which is done uh, using a matching call to restore in case you called save or to restore to count, passing back the ID of the state that was given to you by save to count. Um, I think now it's time for a top tip. So <laughs> how do you do, um, how do you draw uh, semi-transparent composite stuff? So assume you have, for example, two shapes that have to be drawn, I don't know, like a square and a part of an overlapping circle, I don't know, some crazy stuff, and you want to draw it uh, with some transparency. So if you want to do that, uh, and if you just paint them doing two calls to draw rectangle and draw a circle with uh, translucent paint, what happens is that in the intersection areas, they will, uh, the alpha of the two will actually overlap. So the final result will be inconsistent. But there's a, there's a way of doing it which is the same way uh, that the framework does it when you, for example, set the alpha on a, on a view. This is what happens behind the state, the, the behind the screen. Thank you. Um, so basically what you do is you call um, save layer alpha, which is a variation of uh, the previous slide the save thing we have seen. So what that does is it saves the current state of the canvas, creates a layer, which we're going to see is basically a off-screen buffer, and redirects all the calls to canvas that are done from that moment onwards to that buffer instead. So you can basically draw everything somewhere, and then when you call restore, everything that is on that layer is taken and composited back into the main canvas. So in this case, for example, we would, for example, uh, we have called save layer alpha, and now we draw a bitmap, like gnomes. Um, yes, sorry. Uh, now, the, the, in the off-screen buffer, you want to, I don't know, uh, draw, uh, draw a rectangle with some text on it and you want that to have a consistent alpha. What you do is, well, now you start doing your stuff. So you draw the rectangle, you draw the text. Uh, now we're done and we just call restore to count. And at that point, the whole thing, the text and the rectangle are composited back with the original alpha on the canvas. Which was fun. Um, there's one thing to remember about that. When you create a layer, it's an expensive operation. So it's something that you want to do on stuff that doesn't change over time. Uh, there has been recently a blog post by Romain Guy uh, that was actually highlighting that thing. So 
do not call, uh, do not create a layer constantly on every frame because that will kill performances. Because it's basically uh, creating, uh, switching the context on the GPU every time you create a layer, which is not something you want to do because it's a really expensive operation. Okay, that said, um, we have seen what Canvas is, uh, some things about it, but how do you actually uh, get your stuff showing on the screen? So, going to the deepest level uh, on, on Android, the graphics subsystem uses um, the concept of surfaces. A surface is basically, again, a buffer, similar to what a, a canvas is, but this is a really low level one and it's not necessarily in the system memory. There is a thing, uh, a component, which is called surface flinger, which is in charge of handling all the surfaces. So for example, a surface might be a window, so like a, an activity or a or dialogue or something like that. And what the surface flinger does is it composites all the surfaces on the screen. So if you have overlapping windows, you would see like a uh, dialogue usually has its own uh, surface, and you, but you can still see what, what is behind it. So it's surface flinger knowing that it has to show two surfaces at the same time on the screen and composite them. Uh, there are two uh, different implementations of Surface Flinger in Android. One is using OpenGL ES2 and is using the GPU to do the uh, composition. And the other one is a software fallback which is based on OpenGL ES1. So it's a pretty old thing. Um, Surface Flinger, anyway, it's, um, it's using uh, another component which is called Hardware Composer in the case of the hardware accelerated um, surfaces. It's basically an abstraction layer for another kind of buffer, which is n usually not residing on the system memory, but it's instead residing on something else, like a uh, 2D blitter, which is most of the time is inside of the GPU. So it's in a separate place. Um, if you want to read more about this, this is what I was talking about. It's a really lengthy and interesting article on the uh, Android open source website uh, that explains all the components that are uh, at the low level. So Surface Flinger, Hardware Composer, and all those uh, kind of things. So for once, we have good documentation. Use it, read it, it's interesting. Now, moving a bit closer to, uh, to the surface, sorry for the pun, um, we find layers. So we have, we have heard the, the word layer before. What is a layer? Well, a layer is, again, in a, in a way, it's an off-screen buffer. Uh, and every canvas has at least one layer um, that then gets thrown on a surface. The layer can be, uh, a whole layer can be blitted somewhere, and blitting means draw a bitmap, basically. Um, and you just need a pane to do it. So for example, what we saw for uh, Save Layer Alpha, what that was doing was actually, as I said, creating the layer, drawing stuff on it. Well, that's your, your job, drawing stuff. And then what the restore, can, uh, restore or restore to count call does is it uses, um, it blitz, draws the, the, um, the layer back to the main layer. Um, there are different kind of layers when you are using a view. So every view is having a canvas, of course, because that's where you draw stuff. That's how you get stuff showing on screen. And every canvas, as we said, has got a backing layer. Well, there are three kind of layers, actually. Uh, starting from Honeycomb, anyway. Um, the, the old old versions of Android, like up to Gingerbread included, only had uh, software layers, which are basically byte arrays in the system memory. Um, there are other kinds of layers. There's none which, to be completely fair, 
I have no idea what that really means. It's a bit obscure because the documentation says that if you set the layer type on a view to be none, then there is no layer back in the view, but that would mean that the canvas doesn't have a layer, which would mean that you would not be painting anywhere. So, yeah, that's not probably something you want to use anyway. Um, going back to hardware layers, um, those are textures that are um, created and then uploaded to the GPU to be drawn. Um, using hardware layers can improve your performance, uh, for example, in the case of animations, because it allows you, allows the system to only redraw stuff when it needs to, because software buffers need to be redrawn, so calling uh, on draw, actually draw on, uh, on your views every single frame. This doesn't happen on hardware layers because those are created. There's a back in display list, which is basically a list of commands that are then uh, processed used to draw on the, on the layer, and then the layer the, is uh, co uh, compressed into a texture and uploaded to the GPU, so the GPU can compose it without involving the, ch the CPU again. Um, this is, of course, unless you call invalidate on the view, which usually, well, the, the system views do that themselves. For example, a text view will internally call invalidate when you change the text, of course, to make that appear on screen. Um, software layers are cached as well, but you can disable that caching uh, in case you have the need for, which I guess there might be, but I've never seen any reason to do it. Okay, so the last part of the talk is about Skia again, I'm sorry. And to be precise, is about the Skia pipeline. Why, uh, why do you see all those things on the screen? It's actually, this is just a really small subset of the APIs uh, that Canvas has. Uh, there's a lot of them, and I'm not gonna cover all of them because it would take hours. I'm just gonna go with one, which is allegedly the most important one, which is paint. So what is paint? Before going on the Skia pipeline, we really need to understand this. Paint is um, a class that knows, uh, holds all the information that is necessary for Skia to be able to draw something. So it contains information like the color or the texture that has to be used to paint, uh, the stroke width for shapes, uh, the font for text, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and every single drawing call on Canvas will need a paint parameter to be passed along because, as, again, as in real life, if you have a brush but you don't put paint on it, you're not painting, you're just moving it in the air and it's not gonna do anything. It's the same for uh, Android. Um, there is actually one, uh, w only one subclass of paint, which is text paint. Uh, it's pretty much the same thing. The, the name would maybe make you think that text paint is only for text. This is not true. It's actually having a few more fields, so holding a bit more information about how to lay out the text compared to the normal paint. Um, so, behold, the Skia pipeline. This is actually a simplified uh, version of, uh, of a diagram that this guy, Lorenz Gonzalez, uh, put together. It just, he had the infinite patience of going through the Skia code and like taking notes and understanding what goes where and what happens. He has written a really interesting article uh, that I recommend you to read, and I'm gonna show you the link in a second. I just want to uh, point out the thing before moving on, which is, as you can see, the, um, the whole pipeline is actually divided in four main steps. Uh, there is the uh, path generation, which is the first step. Second step is the rasterization. Third step is the shading, and the fourth 
step is, uh, is the uh, transfer. All those four steps concur in the end to create the final image and we'll see what uh, each and every one of them does. This is, in case you're interested, the link for the article that I mentioned before that the uh, flow was taken from. It's really interesting and I strongly recommend you to read it. Okay, so every step of the SCIA pipeline is composed of two steps, uh, two phases, if you want. It's a kind of a two-pass strategy. I don't know if you ever worked, for example, with video. When you do video encoding, there's usually a first pass, which is giving uh, the coded some analysis and information about the content of the video and doing a first guesstimate of how you would actually compress. And then a second pass, which does the actual com uh, compression. Well, in paint, in, in Skia, it's pretty much the same. Uh, there is a first pass, which is the one creating the draft result. And then there is a second one, uh, which usually um, like finalizes the work that the first one has done. Um, every single uh, phase contain, uh, is, uh, you can tap into. And what you do is you apply an effect. Uh, it's called effect, is the name of the, of the class of each phase. Um, those are basically, uh, they get an input which is the state of the, um, of the canvas or the paint or whatever and they generate an output. Um, there's one thing to be said which is by default all the second uh, passes are identity so they just output whatever they get in. You can though add stuff uh, to, to change the way uh, things are drawn. So I'm actually going to skip the first, uh, the first step of the SCIA pipeline, which is the path generation, because there's not much to be said about it. Uh, I'm just going to quickly explain it uh, by voice. The, what the path the generation does is it uh, rasterizes basically the, um, the outline of the stuff you want to draw. So for example, if you're drawing a circle, uh, that will go from the mathematical formula of the shape of the circle to the actual pixels. So that's not much to be said about it. Uh, I'm just gonna move to the second uh, step, which is the rasterization step. So the first effect of the rasterization phase uh, are called uh, mask filters. What the mask filter do is they alter the alpha mask of what you're drawing. What is the alpha mask is basically something that contains the information of which pixels are going to be drawn and which are not going to be drawn because the paint itself does not contain that information. So if you again say I want to draw a circle, as you can see there, uh, what Skia does is it goes through all the pixels and says this is going to be affected, this is not, this is partly going to be affected, this is not, and so on. Um, so there are two kind of mask filters. One is blur, which you can see applied there. Actually, on you would think it's only applied on the top half of the circle. That is not true. It's applied on both parts of the circle, but the top part is a software layer and the bottom part is a hardware layer, which means it's a nice way of saying this will not work on hardware acceleration, uh, hardware accelerated devices. It's not a big deal because there are ways of doing it anyway and to be honest, blur can, can kind of be useful. It's not like blurring the things, just blurring the outlines. So it's not, if you have an image and you use a mask filter blur, it will not blur the image, it will just blur the edges of it. Uh, and the other one is emboss, which unless you're Microsoft in 1992, is not going to be helpful in any way to you, so it's fine. Um, that said, if you really want to know how to do blurring as an aside, 
There's a, an interesting series of posts on uh, styling Android, which is a blog uh, a friend of mine, Mark Allison, uh, writes. Um, he explains how to use render script uh, to and the, the intrinsic uh, the intrinsics that it puts at your disposal to um, to blur stuff quickly. Okay, so moving on, we're now in the shading phase. So the shading phase is the one that dictates the color that the pixel will have once they're drawn. So what we did before was deciding which pixel were going to be drawn. Now we're deciding what color pixel are going to be drawn. There is one really important thing that has to be said, which is the two steps don't know anything about each other. The paint doesn't know anything about uh, the shape it's going to draw, and the um, rasterization phase doesn't know nor care what is the color of the pixels that it's going to draw. So the two things are separated. So what, else, what are shaders? They are the first step of the shading phase. Duh. Um, they are similar if you've ever used uh, OpenGL. Uh, it's conceptually similar to OpenGL shaders. There is one big difference, which is uh, contrary to OpenGL, in Skia shaders are not programmable, which means you just create them and they are immutable. You cannot change the parameters. If you want to change something, you need to create a new shader, um, which is kind of not really true, because if you go to native code, you can actually do that. But in Java, that is not exposed in any way. So I hope you enjoy garbage collection. Um, so we have said that in this phase, we don't know where we're painting. But there is one thing that um, is uh, affecting the way shaders work, which is the tile mode. The tile mode is basically saying, OK, if the paint doesn't really know how to, um, how to paint this region, because, for example, your paint might be using a, uh, an image, so you might be painting a bitmap, and a bitmap has a physical size. But if you want to draw something that is bigger than the bitmap it's itself, then uh, the shader needs to know how to handle that. And there are three kind of um, tile modes, uh, clamp, mirror, and repeat. Clamp basically means I don't care. It's not my business. So whatever happens outside of the um, comfort zone of the paint will be gibberish like that. Uh, mirror means just reflect it. It's like uh, similar to the tiling modes in CSS, if you know about that. And then there is repeat, which is intuitively repeating the same pattern over and over again. So for example, if you're using a, a texture of some kind, then you would use a tile mode of repeat or mirror. Otherwise, you're probably just going to want to be using clamp, which is the most efficient one. Um, so what are the, actually the kind of shaders? There's a bunch of them. Um, the first one is the bitmap shader, which is a shader that knows how to paint a bitmap, uh, which can be, again, a texture or just a simple one-off image. It doesn't really matter. Um, then there is the, it's actually a family of shaders, which is the gradient um, shaders. Uh, there is the linear gradient, the radial gradient, and the sweep gradient. So linear gradient is the one you see. Um, radial gradient is the circular uh, gradient. And the sweep one is the pointless, uh, rather radar-like thing where you have a hard edge and the rest is like drawn around. Uh, there is another kind of shader which is not actually doing anything itself which is the composed shader. So the composed shader is its what allows you to create, basically, uh, you can create a whole structure of, of shaders, so doing using more than one shader in, in a pass. Um, it basically holds two other shaders inside, and it, ha it applies them both at, at the time of painting. In uh, hardware-accelerated layers, 
there is one really, really big limitation on this, which is in composed shaders, you can only have, uh, you cannot nest composed shaders inside of each other, which you can do on software. So you can create a whole tree of composed shaders containing other composed shaders. So you can have uh, a potentially infinite number of shaders uh, being applied at, at any time. On hardware, you can only have two of them. So you can only have one top level composed shaders. And inside of it, you cannot use two shaders of the same type. So you can only have one linear or radial or sweep radiant or, and sorry, a bitmap shader. You cannot have, for example, two bitmaps or two linear gradients or two sweep gradients or two radial gradients. Um, so this was shaders. The next step, the second step of the shading uh, phase are color filters. Uh, you might have seen them because, uh, for example, uh, Drawballs exposed the set color filter uh, method that allows you to recolor uh, the, the drawable at runtime. Uh, what the color filter do is um, they take whatever comes out of the first um, phase of the first step of the shading phase and adjust the colors. So one thing, again, shaders are not programmable. Uh, effects are not programmable in general. Color filters aren't an exception. They don't know about the coordinates. So they affect the color of every single pixel you're going to be drawing in the same exact way. It's a fixed, fun fixed function that cannot be changed. You might, if you have to do complex stuff, you might want to do different uh, uh, drawing steps with different color filters. Um, there are three kind of color filters. Uh, the first one is the color matrix color filter. You have to say it really quickly. Um, that applies a, uh, a matrix trans transformation to the colors and that is the most flexible one and probably uh, actually the, the most useful one because you can, for example, use that to desaturate uh, an image. So transform it into black and white. You can simulate sepia effects or random, really bad looking effects on the colors uh, or actually do nice stuff. Uh, then there is the lighting color filter, which is uh, taking the source color, uh, multiplying it by another color that you pass as a parameter and then adds a second color to the result. Which I, I don't know what that could be useful for, but it's there. Um, and then there is the Porter Duff color filter, which applies a color that you pass in uh, using a Porter Duff mode to the source. What is a Porter Duff mode? Uh, if you've ever used a graphics software like Photoshop or something, then you will know what that is. It's basically the transfer modes for layers. It's pretty much the same. You can look it up on, on the internet anyway works. And going to the, jumping straight to the last step, transfer modes. There are three kinds of transfer modes. The avoid transfer mode, which is given a reference color and a colorimetric distance, it draws all the colors that are uh, within or outside of the uh, of a distance that you specified from the reference color. So for example, if you say I just want to paint red, uh, so you pass in red and you say, I have a tolerance of 20, then only the colors that are color colorimetrically 20 away from red will be drawn. Um, there's the pixel XOR transfer mode, which does the exclusive OR of the, like the bit of the colors. Uh, there's a thing that has to be said about this one. The pixel XOR transfer mode drops the alpha. So if you have any alpha set on the, on the paint and you use that, it will just be opaque, completely opaque, no matter what. Uh, last one, similar to um, the previous step, the Porter Duff transfer mode, which is probably the most useful one. Um, this one, it just blends the source and the destination image using a Porter Duff uh, color mode. Uh, sorry, a Porter Duff transfer mode, my bad.
Okay, so sorry for rushing through the, all the, the last things, but I wanted to give you some time for questions, if you have any. Any question? No? Okay, good. Then, thank you very much.